All right, everybody can hear me? All right. Well, I appreciate everybody joining us here today. There is so much engagement and excitement out there. We feel very privileged to have your time, and we are excited to share this enthusiastic panel about building a better board. Um, I'll be your moderator here today. I'm Erica Smith. I am the CEO of Renetics Bio, which is a Yale spin-out company working in neurology and ophthalmology. I also happen to be uh, a member of Executive Women in Bio, which is actually kind of a little bit of how this came together, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, but I think really what we want to hear from is these amazing panelists and sharing their story. So what I'd like to do is start off by having them um, provide introductions of themselves and giving the perspective of what a board means to them, what's important and kind of their background and experience. I have a number of questions. We're not going to get to everything, but there's going to be really good engagement. And we really do hope that at the end of the session, there'll be time for questions in the audience as well. So, you know, keep those, keep those ready and we'll go from there. So with that, I will talk, turn it, excuse me, turn it over to you. So my name is Jermaine Brookshire Jr. I'm a corporate and healthcare attorney at Wigan and Dana, uh, specifically focusing on emerging growth companies and, and startups, and then also doing healthcare business transactions. I'm also the vice chair of the board for uh, nonprofit Horizons at the Foot School. Um, also serve as the CLE, which is the Continuing Legal Education Director for the Connecticut Bar Association, and serve on their executive board as well. So. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Christine Brennan. I'm managing director at a uh, venture fund called Vertex Ventures HC uh, in the Boston office. It has nothing to do with Vertex Pharmaceutical Company. We are not a corporate venture fund. We're an independent venture fund funded via uh, Tamasic, which is a large sovereign wealth fund of Singapore. Um, so I sit on a number of boards for the companies that we have invested in uh, for VVHC. In the past, I have been um, at U.S. Merck, Merck's Corporate Venture Fund, MRL Ventures Fund. Before that, I was at Novartis Venture Fund. Um, before that, I spent about 10 years in business development, uh, including being a CBO of a biotech company, so having to interact with my board. Um, in that case, um, also at Big Pharma in business development and originally PhD in postdoc in neuroscience. So I'm looking forward to, to all the different perspectives that we're going to be able to bring to, to this talk, topic. Uh, my name is Matthew Batters. I'm um, general counsel at uh, Arvinus, which is a late stage development company. We work in oncology and in neuroscience. I've uh, been there when they were still a private company, we're now public. Um, and prior to that, was with Alexion, also in, in, based in New Haven. And prior to that, um, worked for a couple of international law firms in uh, sort of the corporate governance, uh, transactional corporate securities uh, uh, area, also working with startups. Looking forward to the discussion. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Anneman. I'm Associate General Counsel at NASDAQ and a member of our Center for Board Excellence. So I help public companies to understand our corporate governance standards and how broader securities laws might impact them. And then I also support our own corporate reporting team on our public company reporting obligations, like our proxy statement, annual report, 10 Qs, voluntary ESG reports. So thank you for having me. Actually, I'll just grab this one there. <laughs> All right. Well, you can clearly see there's a variety of backgrounds, and I think that's what we really want to bring as part of this session today is both um, what board, what you need to do to build a board, what you need as good quality, and also I, you know, I really do want to touch on, and I think we will today, is for people that are looking for board service. How can you make sure that you are um, that you have the right resources and, and opportunities to be the best? board member that you can as well. So um, I'm going to start off by asking you all. Um, we, so the title of this is called Building a Better Board. But as we were talking about it, a better board, what does that mean? What we really think it's about optimal. And optimal means things to different people at different stages. And so I'd really like to take the time for the uh, folks to share their experience about what, what optimal boards mean to them. And so we'll go down the line one more time, and then we'll switch it up. Yeah. So for me, especially with me dealing with a lot with startups, you want to think about, especially as a founder, you know, what is it that you need? 
So the board should be there to serve the CEO, should be there also to serve the company. Um, and so I think with that, you know, it starts with the self-assessment about, you know, what are sort of the weak points of you as the, the founder? Do you find yourself being very proficient in, let's say, in your ideas to scale the company, have your pulse to the ground in terms of market potential, but yet you may not have the connections for investors. Um, so you want to be building a board with uh, intention and be very deliberate about that. Um, and I think that's something that you'll find that uh, when you start with that sort of measured sort of uh, idea of constructing your board, you'll find it easier as you uh, position yourself to grow to really make those changes as we'll talk about a little bit later today. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. And I, and I think it depends on the stage of your company. So what you look like as that first financing, that seed financing, and who you have on your board and what you need at that moment in time will be distinctly different than when you're on the NASDAQ and you're a public company. Um, and growing that board through those stages is an important part of growing that the whole company. And, and I think people feel sometimes a little trapped and then they get the board that they get instead of really thinking about who are the who are the people that I need at the various stages? Now, some of them, like me, if I invest in your company, you're going to get me whether you like me or not. <laughs> However, for other cases, you know, you really want to think about how do I structure that board? And if you have the choice around which venture fund that you um, want in your company, part of that thought process that should be going on around is this the right fund to come in should be around are they going to take a board seat or a board observer seat and who is going to have that role and is that somebody that I feel is going to contribute if you have the luxury to be able to choose. I feel like we're going to be echoing one another. <laughs> um, I think you're, you're right in the private context you know you get the board you get sometimes right um, you may have a little bit of flexibility but I think the optimal board in my perspective is, um, you know, what's the problem that I'm going to be dealing with in three years? Um, so if I'm, I, I, I work for a biotech company, uh, when we were preclinical, you know, you, well, we want to find board members who may have experience of R&D, right, who are actually taking things into the clinic. They're not going to manage the business, but they're going to provide valuable oversight, advice, know the risks. Um, so there's that... Um, I'm not solving the problem that's right in front of me, but there's a bit of, you know, what's the road, a, road, road, a, road ahead? And, um, you know, that I think, as Jermaine was saying, the really honest look about where are the gaps, um, you know, looking in the mirror and the, that, that, that self-assessment as to what we, what we need now, what we're going to need in four, for three years, and treating it as a real as a dynamic process as well in terms of board, board evolution and building. It's hard to add anything after hearing all of these insights. Um, but I think, you know, there's not really one right answer here. Um, governance is not a one-size-fits-all thing. And at NASDAQ, we have over 4,000 companies listed. And they range from micro-cap companies to household names that you hear on a daily basis. And it could be that, depending on the company and their maturity where they are in their life cycle and in their industry, there's a different board composition that's right for them at that point in time. But one thing um, that we do see across the spectrum is that there's a need for the board to really understand their role and their duties and their responsibilities. They're not management. Their job is to advise and counsel management on company strategy and leadership succession. So I think when building an optimal board, you want to make sure that, A, the board understands those duties, and then, B, you have the right mix of skills and experiences around the table to help them fulfill those duties. That's great. All right. Well, you can see we've got a lot of different contexts here, and we're going to dig into it now. So. Um, I'm going to start and take it back a step because I think a lot of people in the audience, a lot of people here are all about, gosh, we need to raise some funding. Like that is kind of like the lifeblood of where we are right now and we need to do it. So maybe I can turn it over to you, Christine, put you on the spot. Um, obviously, when you become an investor, there's changes that happen. But maybe you could talk a little bit about 
building the board so that it's attractive when they come to you. Structure, it doesn't have to just be about the board, but maybe kind of the governance piece that you would like to see in place as, you, as, it, as it comes in through the pipeline. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime I'm looking at a potential investment, I always say, and apologies for those who've heard me on a panel before, because I say it pretty much every time, um, there's three pillars to investing. It's science, management, and finance. You, you need to have certain check marks. You're not going to get all the check marks on everything, but you need certain check marks in each one of those pillars to make it an attractive investment. The science, absolutely, it's necessary. I have to be excited about it. I have to see that it's differentiated. It's focused on an unmet need, but that's not sufficient. You need a management team who can take that science and build a company around it and build the people around it who are going to be able to make that science successful. And then you need financing to be able to bring you to value inflection points that are important. And part of that financing pillar that I look at is, who is the board today? Who's on the board? Who has previously invested in this company? What are, are, are they thinking about for the future of this company? Do they see the milestones the same way I see the milestones? Do they see the budget the same way I see the budget? Are we going to be working towards those same things? So as I look at a company that comes to me, I will start with the science, but then really do the diligence behind on the management team and talk to the management team a lot about what do they envision. And then I will ask the management team, who are your board members? What's going on that's good? What's going on that's bad? And then I will talk to all of the board members um, before I make an investment. I want to understand that we're aligned and that we see these things right. If possible, I want to see a diverse board. Um, there are independent board members that are uh, there to balance um, that board and not just have investor board members. Uh, and I want to see that there are a diversity of faces and experiences and cultures because that tends to, as we all know, you know, you have more differences around the table to come in and think about a problem and you usually can solve that problem um, better. So I want to see that. It's hard, especially in a startup, to really see that, right? You have a board of maybe three people and one of them's the CEO, right? So, um, it, you know, it's really then talking to those folks and, and understanding what they see as the evolution of that board and making requests, right? If I have the opportunity to say, well, I want the next independent board member to be a woman or to be uh, a diverse candidate. And you can kind of put that into what you want to see the, the company develop as. But it, it really is, how is the board working right now? Who's on that board? And how do they see both the company developing and the board developing? I think uh, also, Erica, uh, even a step, I would think, before even getting to Christine would be leveraging counsel to make sure that your corporate housekeeping is in check. So there's many a times where you're going for an uh, investment round and you can't find either minutes or you've, you've, you've been closely <laughs> held and you guys just do things through emails or whatnot. Like You may want to utilize counsel to want to ensure that your corporate documents are in line, um, that you know, you, you've, you haven't used LegalZoom to create what you think is a, a fail-safe bylaws and, and, and or operating agreement. Um, but really those things are important because as you reach out to investors, as you go through diligence processes, those are going to be the nitty things that may hold things up. It, um, you, you may not think that it will shine a bad light, but it may look have management look like they're, they, they don't have things in line. Um, so really, you know, work with counsel. Um, to, to, to get a process in line. And then I would say, too, that you're never too small to have um, proper corporate governance. So doing your consents properly, managing min meeting minutes. Like, you want to start that early, and, 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 and developing those best practices early will help you as you grow. That's great. All right, so I'm going to kind of shift gears because I think what you all said is very, very valuable. I'm going to go to you, Matt, because you kind of are the, the two pieces here, and then I want to go to you, Emma, uh, to sort of like take us home for the, the IPO. Um, so, so question to you is, could you talk through the Arvinus building? I know you're, you know, kind of early on days, there were probably, you know, just setting up the corporate governance. Perhaps there was some change that happened as you decided that you were going to go public and kind of maybe walk us through a little bit of that story. Yeah, sure. And some of this is going to be a personal story because I joined Arvinus in 
uh, February of 2018. We were just before our, pri our crossover round, so we, we went uh, public in September of that year. And at that point, we were still in an LLC. We converted to a C Corp uh, later that year as well. Um, and you know, as Christine talked about, um, our board was fairly heavily uh, investor focused. There were a lot of uh, VC members, and so. Um, one of the things, you know, in preparation for that IPO was, you know, how do we identify and, and, and add independent um, directors, knowing that the IPO is going to be a triggering event for, for many people, right? So there are many, many, many VCs who don't even want to be on the, uh, the board day, day one after because, you know, for, for all the good reasons that we can, we, you know, articulate in terms of they need to move on to the next thing. They, they, they'll take the lockup, but they want to be able to trade, their, to, to, to monetize their investment. Um, and, and so there is, you know, you're, you, you, you need to prepare for that event with, uh, you know, how do I start to fill some of these gaps? It's a great opportunity as well, right? Because, you know, maybe there's an opportunity there to, to, to be adding public company expertise as well. So you may have board members who haven't necessarily operated in, in, say, in, in a public company, which in and of itself is a, is a, is a skill set. Um, so one of the things that we've done, on, and maybe this, it's pretty basic, but on an annual basis is uh, a self-assessment by directors and a, and a, a, a questionnaire. And the, the self-assessment is, you know, a ranking of one to five across a, a 20 categories, and everyone is, you know, everyone rates themselves a one out, or, you know, one the highest or whatever it might be. No, but there is an honest, an honest assessment of, you know, I have skills in leadership, I have skills in m and I'm, I'm weaker in cybersecurity, whatever the, and that list of skills in, in, inevitably changes year on year in terms of what your, is in front of you, what you have coming down the pike. But that allows a, a really, it's a really valuable tool in terms of uh, planning, thinking in you know, a succession. And I think we use that tool even you know, in the ordinary course, when you're nominating the same slate again for a, at, a, at a meeting, you, you know, this is not a check the box exercise. We still have to sort of think: are other people we're nominating here still the appropriate nominees to represent represent us? Um, and then that questionnaire, I think, uh, 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 serves a different purpose. It's not necessarily about skills, but is the relationship that the, the management team has with the board working? Right? Is it uh, is the board hearing what it needs to hear? Do they, are they aware of the strategy? Are there things they'd like to see that we're not that we're not necessarily articulating? And that is a good sort of recalibration, I think, a really necessary recalibration of, you know, uh, of, of ensuring that you're hitting the right topics, that you're working, you know, course correcting if the relationship is, you know, need, needs a bit needs a bit of work. So, um, you know, we, we've seen, certainly seen uh, as a public company, we, we've seen you know major turnover. I think we have maybe one or two board members who were pre-IPO um, board members and, you know, since 2018 have added, you know, significant um, gender diversity and, and, and racial diversity to our board as well, you know, which I think has been very purposeful, uh, uh, you know, on, on behalf of the management team as well. So I could talk about Arvindus forever, and I just want to be, you know, just, as I am a lawyer, so I just want to say, you know, this is not a proxy solicitation. Our, our annual meeting is coming up soon. <laughs> so don't vote based on what, on what I'm saying. Well, I, yeah, I want to take, turn, turn it over, because I think, one of, you know, some, some of the points you make, and I think it's one of, so happy to have NASDAQ, you know, and you represented here, because I think for us, you know, for younger companies thinking about some of the standards that are being put out there to go public and making sure that you have the diversity on the board, that you have resources to, you know, to draw upon. I think there's been an amazing work done with NASDAQ, and I'd love for you to share about how to make good companies even stronger with the resources that exist. Yeah, thank you. So I think once a company has all of its housekeeping in order, as Jermaine mentioned, and is ready to go public, then on NASDAQ and other stock exchanges, there are minimum listing standards that they have to meet. And one of them is around board independence, like Christine was saying. You need to have a majority independent board. Another one is around financial expertise. So you need to have someone who's considered a financial expert or financially sophisticated and that person will sit on your audit committee. But then a company will also have a nom and gov committee, a compensation committee, they might have a sustainability committee. 
So this just shows the, the broad perspectives and experiences that you need to have on your board. You need that diversity of thought and skills and experience. And at NASDAQ and any other public company, really, you'll see in their proxy statement um, a skills matrix. And it sets out the skills that they're prioritizing. At NASDAQ, ours is on page 18 of our proxy. It's in the audience materials if you scan the QR code. But it essentially comes out of the self-assessment that Matt was mentioning. And you'll see that we prioritize skills like cybersecurity and technology, sustainability, and capital markets. But that's based on our own strategy and our own priorities. So it's different from company to company, but we are seeing across companies that boards are prioritizing gender and race diversity, as Christine mentioned. And at NASDAQ, we've developed resources and partnerships for companies that are looking to broaden their search beyond their traditional network and include diverse candidates that are board ready and qualified. So we've included links to those in the audience materials as well. Um, if you're a company or board or even interested in serving on a board, there are resources for you to access. I like that you're already giving the plug. So you guys like get, <laughs> get your QR code scanned here. We got, we got a lot of good resources that we've put together both from the panel and also um, access to talent as you were talking about. So I'm going to shift us a little bit now. Um, you know, sort of there's this challenge, I guess, especially with earlier companies, um, between board and management. You're wanting to have good relationships, you're going to drive the company in the right place, but you want to make sure, I think, that everybody knows their lane and what, what they need to be thinking about. And I, I'll, I'll again pick on Christine again because I feel like there, you know, there may be some things that you're seeing with things that are coming in to get funded that may or may not have those pieces right. And for an audience that may be looking to come in and for that conversation, we want to make sure they're aware of the, some pitfalls and, and good things that they should put into place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, I think for me, the overarching what is a board supposed to be doing is, as has been already mentioned a couple of times, it is to help the company with the 10,000 foot strategy, right? We are not the management team. If I find myself in that starting to go down that road as a board where we're managing the company, that means the management team is not doing their job and something is wrong. And we have to, as a board, figure out what that is. Maybe it's a CEO change. Maybe that CEO is great for the seed, but now we're getting into a, a, a point in the development of the company where that CEO is no longer has the skill sets to, to lead us there and we need to have somebody who has more experience. We're not supposed to be running the company. You will find the occasional board member who is an operations person who thinks they're supposed to be running the company. <laughs> so we as a board have to regulate ourselves as well, as well as the independents, as well as the CEO, to make sure that they're also giving us feedback where are we helping? Where are we not helping? How can we make sure that we're supplying what the team needs the board to, to do to support them? A lot of that is um, as they hire the C-suite. You know, we interview the C-suite. Um, we think about, we help them think about where are the skills that uh, they need to fill in. Um, Maybe there's an issue with culture, and the CEO will bring that question to us and say, we're having X or Y issue. How can we think about this again from a, from a strategic level to see if there are things that we can do to support the company? So it, it is not just the boards there to say, what milestones did you hit? Why didn't you hit those milestones? We're not going to give you any more money until you hit those milestones. That's not the boards. It's what boards sometimes talk a lot about, but that's not really the function of the board. The function of the board is to really be a partner to help get the company to those places and make sure that budgets do make sense. We do have a team that's the, the right team. We do fill in those places where we need to fill in, especially as the company grows. As a venture fund in, uh, person invested on the company, I have two hats, right? I have my board hat. My fiduciary responsibility is to the board and to that company. That's my responsibility. I have to take that hat off and I have to put on my shareholder hat when we have shareholder votes, which I am now representing my fund. 
And so as a board member, you have to understand those distinctions and you have to make sure that you're always answering with the right hat on. And it is very tempting a lot of times to have your shareholder hat on and want to influence a company in a certain way because my, I, I've put as much money as I can into this company. I really want this company to get acquired. I, I, you know, and that's my shareholder hat. What does the board hat say? The board hat says the company's not ready for that. If we just put in $10 more million, we could get this to the place that it really needs to be. So sometimes you have those conflicting pushes and pulls, um, and you really have to understand that and be honest with yourself as that, and when you're in that situation to make sure that you, are, you have the right hat on at the right time and as a board member are really supporting the company being that fiduciary responsibility to the company and making helping those companies make those decisions together. That's great. And assuming that a company gets it right between the management balance and the board, which I would hope when they come to you they would, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, uh, the um, NASDAQ and some of the resources that exist um, to continue to educate and to improve board member quality um, as part of the work that you have there as well. Yeah, it's really important because we're seeing both within NASDAQ and across companies this need for continuous board education on emerging issues like climate change, like AI, like digital assets. Board members need to be equipped with the knowledge and the resources to understand these complex issues so that they can really ask management about the risks and the opportunities and understand the competition in this space and how it impacts company strategy. Um, one area, for example, where there is an increased focus is climate change. And we've seen under the SEC's proposal that it could require companies to include climate metrics in their financial statements. And those need to be reviewed and approved by the audit committee. So there's a need for the audit committee and the full board to really understand these climate metrics. And I think this just shows, you know, it's constantly evolving. And we publish quarterly blog posts through our Center of Board Excellence to keep boards updated on these emerging issues. And another plug for the QR code, <laughs> there's a link in there. Um, but beyond that, within NASDAQ, we also create personalized programs for each director, depending on the skills that they want to continue building or new areas that they want to grow into. And we'll curate programs, introduce them to different management teams. They'll have a director mentor for the first two years. But we also constantly refresh our online board portal so that they're receiving articles in real time and being continually updated. Um, and that's one area where we've seen like directors are able to be more proactive rather than reactive as these, these new issues arise. Great. So let's assume, let's just for, for funsy's sake, assume we've got a board member that provided all of this, but it's time for that per board member to go. It, because for whatever reason, we need, to, we need to have some change. Either they're not changing enough with the company, or when they've done this competency assessment, it's not what the company needs at this stage. So um, could I, Jermaine, could I, could I ask you to talk about sort of structuring, how to think about that, not so that the company doesn't get kind of backed into a corner and yeah. doesn't have that flexibility because it's, it's a difficult yeah. piece to kind of change over. So maybe talk sure. a little bit about that. So, I mean, your governing documents are going to outline the sort of term limits uh, for your board. Uh, something that naturally may happen is, let's say, when you're thinking about board compensation, um, typically at the early stage, it will be equity compensation. You'll probably link that to some sort of vesting schedule and uh, a sort of underlying nod to the board member that you don't want them back is you may not offer them more equity to stay. Um, <laughs> But um, there's that's the, subtle. Well, I mean, because if you, if, I mean, just practically speaking, you know, after a board member's term is up, if you want them to continue with the company, you may do another a re-up, a different offer. Um, so I mean, it's those things to think about. Uh, Matt pointed out that the board should be really, you know, thinking and, and Christine just the idea of being dynamic. So looking at where where are the weak points, uh, how is the company doing? Uh, the the management. Um, 
the, the performance of the company is not just a reflection of management. It may also be a reflection on the board. Um, and typically you may have a, a chairperson designated or some sort of lead person with the board. Um, they're the ones that will typically be leading the uh, board assessment um, and, and, and figure out whether or not you want to do a more formal uh, full board review, whether it will be that sort of peer um, board assessment. But, but those things sort of naturally come to light. I mean, when you're dealing with a for-profit company, you're looking at profit, and if the profits aren't doing what you want them to do, you then start looking at, you know, well, who, who's in charge and, and whether or not the people there, have we intentionally placed board members to allow for them to, uh, you know, shine the light on the blind spots that, that need to be filled. Um, I think something that I know we'll get into is uh, a, a piggyback off of this would be thinking about the diversity of the board. So I, I want to caution when we think of diversity, not just thinking in terms of uh, race, uh, eth ethnicity, um, and even gender. You're, you, those things um, are helpful to think about because naturally you will uh, inform the think tank to have different perspectives um, that will shine a light on things that even Ama pointed out. Maybe you 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 have someone whose background was you know. Uh, in an environment and you bring them up to the board and they may see some things where you really add value to the company in that way. So uh, I will say that when you're thinking about building the board, you may need to also think about, well, am I reaching out to um, contacts that are sort of outside of my norm? Uh, have I stayed within my comfort zone? Um, and in doing that, if you stay within your comfort zone, you may find that you're actually hampering the growth of the company. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that, you know, again, when we're thinking about diversity, we're thinking about it as an asset to the company to make sure that it's dynamic. Right. Maybe. And just to add, you know, when, and I'll let the people who have much more expertise on this uh, speak more to this, but it, it's different when you need to get, when you have a board member that's no longer really uh, appropriate for the stage of the company when that company is private versus when that company is public. Public, the, it, there's a lot more visibility around the, the board. There's a lot more sort of duties that the board uh, members bring and th it is, um, there's a, much more of a microscope that's put on the, on the board and ensuring that that board is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And there are mechanisms that are more formalized in which you can remove a board member or trans, you know, say that this is no longer, you're no longer the person we need at this moment in time and bring a new board member in. It's a lot harder <laughs> on a private uh, company when your company is still private because your board is, um, really made up again. A lot of the folks that are there are the ones that are the ones that invested, right? And you can't really kick me off. <laughs> I hate to tell you this. Um, if we don't put more money in, uh, if we're a, a true problem, and there are things that I'm doing that are inappropriate, absolutely. But if you just don't get along with me, that's not sufficient, unless you can rally <laughs> the rest of the board. So having those relationships with each one of those board members and making sure as a CEO you're not just checking in quarterly at your board meetings and doing a prep call a week beforehand, and then in between I never hear or talk to you, that's not, not a good way to maintain your board and maintain those relationships. You need relationships with each one of the board members. Those relationships are going to be slightly different because the people are slightly different. And if there is a distinct problem on the board, it's really talking to the other board members to be able to say, do we all agree this is a problem? We all agree this is a problem. Then there are ways in which the board as a whole can go about changing um, up a board member if that board member is no longer really performing the way that they should. But it is a lot more difficult to do that when you're private than when you're public. And so you really need to be very thoughtful around making sure you have independent relationship, especially as the CEO, but generally the C-suite should have relationships with each one of the board members. Oh, that's great. I love where you led this because I think there's so much about culture, culture in the company, culture in the board. You know, a really run, well-run organization is going to have, you know, a team that comes together, teams at the board, teams at the company level. And it, if you don't have that right bit, 
you, it can really disrupt things. So I know Matt, not to name names, I'm sure you, all board members have been great, but it does sound like there's been some change over at the board level. So maybe to the extent you can talk about building culture, building team, you know, both at the management level and also at the board level, um, it would be really interesting to hear how our Venice is approaching that. Yeah, sure. And I guess I'll touch first on, we do, we sort of pulse check, right? That part of the questionnaire I mentioned was, you know, there are explicit questions about how does the board, what's the board dynamic like, how is it working, how does it operate, you know, in executive session, uh, how does it operate when, with, with, with management, do they feel as though they have access to management to, uh, you know, not just what they're served at a board meeting, but to ask questions to, so they, to fulfill their uh, fiduciary obligations. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really vital piece. I just want to just uh, come back to something that... Um, um, Jermaine talked about there, just I want to emphasize the network piece, because um, that's something which we've certainly seen uh, in the evolution of the board. Uh, the, our board members have been phenomenal, it, it, uh, it, you know, historically we're, we're very, very strong in terms of identifying additional uh, um, board members, you know, adding some, some diversity of, of, of um, you know, some gender diversity and certainly to other skills, but I think you're absolutely right, you do start to sort of seeing See, see, you're looking in the mirror, right? You start to see um, the same faces or faces that are going to create a bit of an echo chamber. So, I don't know, on the, I'm going to do a plug for the QR code again. There are some, <laughs> there are some phenomenal resources there. And, 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 and of course, the, the, the more obvious one is perhaps there are times when you just have to say, we're going to engage a search firm. Uh, that's, that's the remit of the, you know, the, the Nom and Gov committee should be able to do that. And, um, you know, if you've got well-written corporate governance guidelines, you know, I hope you've got in your guidelines that they're, they're going to you know, pr pr provide you with a diverse slate, right? Um, so th there are ways in which uh, you can absolutely, you know, pay for those external resources as well. And I think one of the key pieces there, we talked about, and I'm probably not going to say much about managing people out, but, um, you know, some, sometimes that's not often how succession works, right? Oftentimes it's, I put my hand up, I'm done, I'm overboarded because I've, you know, I have other, other commitments or personal reasons or I, and new opportunities or whatever it might be. And as a, as a public company, that, um, those don't always happen at the times you might want them to happen. <laughs> so uh, the Nom and Gov committee having a sort of clear, if not keeping people warm, because that feels a bit, you know, but, but you have to, it's a constant succession a conversation, right? Who are we? Who are we talking with, um, so that you you know you feel as though <laughs> if you have a departure that you may may, not, may have been unplanned, that you feel as though you can quickly manage that as a transition. That's great. All right, so I'm going to go. I want to make sure we have time to open it up to the audience. And it, by the way, if you don't, if you guys don't give me questions, I've got the you know the backup plan here. But uh, I feel like you guys are going to want to ask these folks a lot of questions. But before we get to that, maybe I just go down the line one more time and just say just say if there's any key advice, you know, kind of on the conversations that we've had to summarize, like what these folks when they walk out of here should should definitely keep keep track. Yeah, um, I, just to, to sum up a lot of what I said is just think about what community or market you're serving um, and what's the mission of the company. And in thinking about those two things, you then want to be intentional about who you're putting on. Um, again, we've been saying that the board should be dynamic. Your company will be dynamic. As you guys know, you know, for those of you who have companies for a while, you know, things, the landscape looks different than it did 10 years ago. It's going to look very different in another 10 years. Um, and so with that, as Matt's been pointing out, you need to constantly check the pulse of the board, um, you know, and, and respectfully let people go and, and phase them out when they're not serving the new, the new, the new needs of the company. Um, and so I just think they'll keep those things in mind. Again, uh, who are you serving and whether or not who is uh, in charge of, uh, of the company, are they helping to propel the company forward towards its mission? Yeah everything Jermaine said for sure. Um, and as an early stage company, it's really, really be thinking about as you go into venture funds, who within that venture fund uh, do I want to have uh, on my board? Especially if you have that luxury to make choices between you know, this fund versus that fund coming in. It, it is so critical to have a functional board, having been on both really great boards, pretty good boards, and really bad boards, 
it, you know, a functional board is, is everything. <laughs> so be very thoughtful around the funds that you go to and the people within those funds that you start those conversations with is those are the ones that are going to end up on your board. Um, and, and again, just make sure that you're talking to every board member frequently. Do not leave us in the dark. Do not ever surprise <laughs> surprise a board at a board meeting with any news, great news or incredibly shitty news. Don't <laughs> surprise your board with that. You will not remain on the C-suite for very much longer <laughs> after that happens. So just really, it's all about you know really thoughtful. Who do you need? How do you need them? Making sure that you um, maintain your rights to have that independent person on the board or people on the board, make sure to be thoughtful about those people because those are the balance to the venture investors and make sure to continue to talk to the board, not just quarterly. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if there's trepidation about an upcoming board meeting, it means something you, you haven't been communicating appropriately or you haven't been... So, so I think I'm just... It's a, it's a yes and. So I think more, more, absolutely what Christine and Jermaine have been talking about. Um, the dynamism is really important. Remembering that the board's role is, you know, they are... They're in a public company setting. They're obviously representatives of the, sh of the shareholders as well. So they have a fiduciary obligation there. They have a, obviously uh, a, a, an obligation to oversee uh, risk as well. Uh, I think as we to, to, to echo what we've talked about, um, clear articulation of management's roles and responsibilities and the board's roles and responsibilities, and 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 that will sometimes you know that, that that'll that'll change over time as uh, as well. So dynamism in in so many different. Um, uh, senses of the word is, 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 is what I'd leave people with. So I think um, from what I'm hearing and from what I'm seeing at NASDAQ, like there is this need for the right mix of skills and experiences on the board. And you need people that can help you navigate like evolving regulations and these trends like climate change and AI, and chat GPT. Um, <laughs> but once you have that mix of skills and experiences on the board, you need to keep them continually educated. So we've been hearing dynamism as a theme. The board is dynamic, but skills are dynamic too. Directors can grow their skills or skills, if they're not exercised or they're out of the industry for too long, can grow stale. So there is this need for continuous education. All right. All right. Well, you've heard it from the panel. So I will turn it out to the audience uh, for any questions that you may have. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, a question for Jermaine. You mentioned about compensation. Our board, is your board due as a startup? Do you need to pay your board in equity, money, or what What should I expect? So it's a great question. Um, generally at the startup stage, uh, you cash is king. You don't want to give away your cash. And I would, you know, each situation depends, but if you're going after a person to be on your board and they tell you I need $10,000, you probably should run the other way. Um, just at that early stage. Um, so generally, you, you, it's equity first. Um, you see on the sort of low end will be half a percent uh, and up to on the high end will be around 3%. But again, it all, it all depends. And really that range is based upon the level of expertise uh, of the individual. Um, and then I will say to that, though, the caveat is generally you'll be paying for like general board expenses. So let's say before COVID when things weren't... Um, always on Zoom, you know, if I'm on your board and I, you get me from DC and I'm flying in, you, you know, that's something that the company would typically pay for. Um, and then also to, let's say if for some reason I was very adept at um, doing the slide deck for pitches, um, those sort of special projects, you know, you may want to negotiate uh, a rate uh, for that particular board member to do that. Um, so, so it, again, it depends, but at, at, at start, at the startup stage, they shouldn't be on some sort of pay scale from um, to cash. Thank you, Erica. Um, I 
follow up a little bit on what you were saying, Jermaine, a little earlier. I think it was you that sort of really spoke about, you know, the subtle way of, you know, a documents and also um, more, more just, hey, we're not giving you more, uh, more equity going forward. Uh, more from the, I want, I'd love, and any of you can answer is more from the, you know, look, this was a seed investor or it was a family office that put in, and so they, of course, wanted their 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 board seat, but now we have larger investors that are coming in. You know, how do you navigate that? Is there, are there any suggestions you can have on that? And so, well? yeah, I'm, that, that's really a great question for Christine. I know one thing I'll just add on, uh, start with that is, yeah, once you start uh, going into different uh, financing rounds, that lead investor is really going to tell you what you're going to do. Um, so you can have your, your thoughts, um, but uh, Christine, you can go ahead and take it. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you when you have angel investors or or family offices, a lot of times, of course, they will want to be on the board um, at that seed round. And when the Series A comes, it, it's really those people that have the skill sets again to help you bring that company to the next the, those next value inflections through the A, B, C, and sometimes even D at this point, right? And it's really the lead investor will say love this, I'm going to put in 30 million, we're going to give you 70, we're going to reform your board, basically. And it's really a negotiation. I, If I'm putting the term sheet in, I will have already spoken to those angel family uh, folks that are on the board right now. A lot of times the seed document actually even makes that clear, that they are here through that seed. They then have the right to put pro rata in, but then they have to step off the board. A lot of the seed documents these days have that just to make it abundantly clear, but if it's not clear, I will have already spoken to them and say, look, we, we need to bring in expertise that you guys just don't have. Happy to have you as an observer for a period of time until the room gets too big and these, these days it's not as bad because we do have zoom and we can do things more online but yeah that's that's the lead the lead that's coming into your series a or b or c is the one that is saying here's how big we we want it and here are the folks and i want two seats or whatever right so so the, they're they're the ones that will help you i mean i always talk to them and then i talk to the management team and say this is what my vision is is what is your vision as the management team who do you think you need and let's build the board together if you're doing it appropriately as the lead investor. I think uh, quickly, too, because uh, Christine mentioned a term sheet, I will say that um, in thinking about that, you may want to think about engaging counsel during the term sheet stage. So sometimes you'll have it where you've, you're, you know, you, you're sweetened up, you're thinking about the money that's coming in from the investor. Uh, so you're like, you know what, uh, I'm going to send a term sheet to my attorney after I've already discussed a term sheet. Well, there's this sort of thing that we don't really like to retrade, re renegotiate the, the term sheet once it's signed. So you may want to think about engaging counsel at that stage. Again, you are going to be beholden to the um, investor, but at least we can tell you whether or not something is market um, and, and just provide you with a little bit more assurance and, and put some more blockers for you at that stage. But typically, once you sign the term sheet, you're just on for a little bit of a ride. Yeah, just to re-emphasize that point. <laughs> I would be, I'd be terrified if I gave you a term sheet and you just signed it and you didn't have counsel. <laughs> I would start to rethink the term sheet and do I need a new team? So absolutely, you should never do anything without your law <laughs> team right next to you, looking at all of this, telling you what you you know what we want because they'll know what we want. They know what standard in the industry. They know what you want. They'll be able to really help you think about how do you no negotiate that with me, especially if this is one of your first times negotiating that term sheet. So they're, they're invaluable and never do anything without your counsel. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, I, I had a question about best practice about uh, executive compensation and negotiating that with the board, um, particularly after the seed stage, um, you know, sort of more middle, middle of the, you know, halfway down the journey, if you will. And also, just with respect to cash and future equity and equity you already have. Yeah. So, it, you know, at the seed, you're obviously a lot of times a lot of folks aren't even taking, you know, CEOs sometimes don't even take, you know, a, a, a salary for a bit of time as they get everything up off the ground. Um, when the Series A and you're getting real, you know, multi million dollars of cash coming in, that that is definitely part of what we look at as investors is making sure that the entire team from the C-suite on down to the, you know, 
intro research uh, associate that they all have the appropriate compensation and the appropriate equity and we will set out as part of the negotiation on the term sheet is how much equity for um, employee stock is available as part of this round and typically in an early stage company it's between 10 and 20 percent in that for that series a because there's a lot of equity that needs to be distributed not only to the people that are there but you're also thinking in the future during this financing um, over the next two and a half years you have to hire people and so you want to have enough equity to be able to hire people in and, and make sure that they have the right amounts of equity there's a, a ton of reports that you can purchase um, but we just know kind of from what is standard amongst our portfolio companies generally what the ranges are for salary what the ranges are for um, uh, equity compensation for the CEO in a startup in a series a they're probably getting and Jermaine can probably correct me if I'm wrong they're probably getting in that sort of three to five percent range as the CEO, and then the CEO generally has the most, and then it could, kind of comes down from there. CM, CMO, very tough uh, to find great CMOs, so they definitely get quite a bit uh, of equity close to what the CEO is getting. Um, so depending on the skill sets and depending on the person you need and how difficult it is to find those good people, you might get more, a little bit more, or a little bit less than other C-suite people, but that's kind of the range, and it is always a negotiation as part of the term sheet of what is that equity stock uh, uh, agreement, how, what's the percentage that we're going to re-up, because you had certain amounts at the seed, you have certain amounts at the C Series A, and then for every series after that, it's making sure that equity is being added as part of the financing so that that equity pool doesn't just go to zero at some point, right? If you just did that without re-upping the equity pool, by the time you got to Series C, employees would have no more equity to be able to give at the end of the year for bonuses, for new people. So it's always part of the discussion around how much um, do we think is appropriate for this stage company and making sure we have enough for the for the folks that are um, on board and going to come on board. Quick, quick follow up on that. Uh, just the three to five percent. Is that total for those executives or is that new to incentivize them for Going it's usually total. So usually a CEO, if you're looking at a Series A company and you look at their equity that they would have, they would have about three to five percent total in um, in common stock uh, as CEO, and that we want to maintain that. So depending, sometimes you have to readjust and adjust up. And when you're ready to go public, and I'll let Matt speak to this, there's an adjustment that happens from private to public as well, because public is usually there's more stock that's given, especially at the CEO level. Um, but as we go from A, B, C, we want to make sure that the, the C-suite, well, that everybody is really maintaining the appropriate amount of equity and that that, so that you don't start at five. And by the time you're at D, you have to, right? We want to make sure that you're continuously re-upping people's equity so that they're maintaining the appropriate amount of equity for their level and for their skills. Yeah, I just really wanted to quickly, I saw Courtney come in from Aon, so I want to just like name check, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, and in the public company setting, of course, you know, the use of compensation advisors is really, really important, right? The, 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 the compensation of your board and of your executives is transparent, you know, through your proxies and through your, you know, the, the filings that you make. And so the, the importance of, uh, of uh, an advisor to help you with those decisions, to help you find appropriate peer groups, uh, it, you know, can't, can't understate it because, um, you know, I think there's a bit of, of, of magic about the, pre, the, the private setting and in the public setting it's unfortunately, uh, you know, a lot more uh, uh, scrutiny. So I want to apologize because I don't think we got to all the questions, although our esteemed panelists will hopefully be willing to talk with you afterwards. Um, but I want to thank you for your time, for the questions, for the engagement. I also do want to point out, because we didn't do it enough, the QR code that we have here. Um, but specifically on this, if you do go to it, I wanted to make you aware um, Executive Women in Bio has put on a local executive board program here in Connecticut where we've identified really significant talent that are board ready individuals that are local to here. We have their board bios linked to this. So if you are looking to build out your company and other resources, they are, those resumes are there and we're also recruiting for the fall cohort as well. So Courtney Connors, who's sitting here, will be managing that and then a lot of other resources that we referred to at NASDAQ and other places to look for talent and to continue to build your skills. So thank you very much, really appreciate it and thank you to the panel. Thank you.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.